Okay, so talking about um, poor responders, I'm feeling that uh, some of the things that we that I'm going to present was already were already presented here, but uh, I will try to give it uh, my perspective, and we'll go um, fast through the things that were already been discussed. So you can see by the slides that uh, obviously one over is looking to produce a low response and the other one will produce high response. And I think that is one of our biggest challenges uh, of trying to treat these patients. And I know that uh, um, in some of the clinics here, a patient will go pretty readily to use donor eggs, but uh, especially in Israel, some religious barriers and some others will make us many times keep on going with these patients. So we also know that the greater the number of protocols are, the poorer the evidence of any particular one. So that's the same case with uh, what we have with poor responders. So we'll talk a little bit about the criteria again, quickly, the epidemiology and mainly the management and a little bit about futile treatments or when do we need to stop. So when I was uh, preparing this uh, lecture, I came across this uh, very excellent meta-analysis at the Human Reproduction Update. Uh, I took some slides from it and I uh, urge you to read it because it gives you, it doesn't give you any answers about what to do with your poor responders, but it just show you what happened with poor response uh, treatment for the last 16 years, which is fascinating to read. So let's look at criteria for a minute. Look at that. I'm not expecting you to read it, of course, but look at how many uh, different criteria have been published, and that's only from the year 2000 to the year 2009. So there are 24 papers here, but each one used its own criteria. And that's partially what makes us uh, um, not realize what will be the best solution for this uh, patient. So at the Bologna um, meeting uh, that was joined with ASRM and ASHRAE, the main thing was to try to establish those guidelines that will help us uh, if to make future studies. Now, um, what th the purpose of their uh, meeting was to try to set up guidelines that will help us make better research. And again, that was, the, uh, study, that was their criteria. We discussed that before. So at least two uh, of the following uh, three, advanced maternal age, any other risk factor of poor viral reserve, previous cycle that was uh, poor, or abnormal uh, ovarian reserve test. Again, they mentioned that, and I will um, stress that out, that this was only for research purposes, so if you have a patient that is poor responder by that Bologna criteria or by any other criteria, that by itself is not good enough reason to um, decline um, treatment from him or from her. So there was a few years after that was published, uh, uh, Busnelli tried to look at uh, if these uh, um, papers, if, if these criteria actually worked, so his study question was do the Bologna criteria of poor responders successfully identify women that did poorly with IVF? And in a short answer, the answer was yes. So that, that criteria were um, um, uh, shown successful uh, in a few articles. So they are, these are good criteria to use. So let's look at these two patients. So she's 40, her FSH was 14, but during her IVF cycle, we were able to produce eight oocytes. Is she a poor responder? By the guidelines, she is. But if she had eight oocytes, I think that response was pretty well. And on the other side, the 35-year-old, which is under the, the cutoff of the age, her AMH is low, but that was the only parameter that was low. So she is not included here. That was her first IVF cycle. And here we had two oocytes. So even in the criteria, they are a patient that won't fit in correctly. So we all know this graph decrease in the um, Ovarian reserve start, um, well, it starts early, but at the age of 35 and closer to the age of 40, we keep on losing eggs. And that was on the cover of uh, Time magazine that uh, this lady say, I can't believe it, I forgot to have children. So some of us during the career will forget to do that. Again, we know that the main reason uh, for most of our poor response will be the oocyte quality that goes with age. 
and we can also show that by this uh, uh, famous graph again that shows donor eggs versus uh, donor eggs here versus her own eggs and you can see the difference so implantation is fine even with older uh, women and we know that by using donor eggs. So let's talk a little bit about management. Again, most of uh, the study that I show, since we talked so many times in different lectures here about poor response, so some of that will be our old friends from the past, but we will look at some data. So again, how can we improve um, our success rate? So again, from that excellent uh, review in the uh, human reproduction update, these are, for the last 20 years, the studies that have been uh, published, the RCTs that have been published about poor response. So obviously we will not talk about all that, but it's good to read that. Again, they will not, they didn't do a meta-analysis because there was only one study from each arm, maybe two more that uh, didn't support this uh, result, but you can see that how many things uh, were uh, here, and I chose to talk about a few of them. This is another slide that I wanted to show from the same article, looking at what kind of uh, cycles do we combine. So at the beginning, in, in the early years, they did agonist, antagonist, and flare. After that, a little bit more um, um, antagonist protocol with more flare and some addition of LH and uh, letrozole. And recently, you see that there are many more variation and many more cycles. So the RCTs were a conflicting result. The amazing thing is only one in 10 RCTs has reported statistically significant difference. And most of the time, there was only one article that was approving that. No positive intervention was supported by more than one positive RCT. So we'll a little bit talk about if increasing the dose help, friendly IVF or the, the use of a long VA, natural IVF, DHEA, and whatever the time will allow us. So let's talk about increasing dosage. So simple solution to simple problem. If I don't get enough eggs, maybe I have to just increase my stimulation. So is that really what's going on? So this uh, was published from uh, our unit, and again, trying to compare between 600 and 300 times two that we sometimes give our patient, probably with no good reason, to 450 units that uh, is the next level down. So we actually found that the number of 2PN embryos was higher in the lower dosage uh, group. Of course, there was no difference in pregnancy rate because this group, at, at the people that we looked at, the women that we looked at, uh, didn't uh, achieve a pregnancy. We just wanted to look at the stimulation um, itself. Another study that uh, looked at the difference between 450 uh, to 600 units also concluded that uh, the addition of the dosage did not uh, improve uh, the result. So adding more and more and more, I don't think will get us anywhere. Friendly IVF. So again, that was on the cover of one of the magazines in the States, say the stuff that IVF nightmares are made of. And if we talk to our patient that have to look at all these amount of needles and go with all these injections, and sometimes their tummies will look like that, I think that if we are talking about Elonva, that could produce a, a nice solution for patient that is about to face uh, quite a few cycles. So the Elonva is a long acting gonadotropin. I know that it's not here in India, but it will probably get here. So at the beginning it was for the normal responders and it was 150 units. But with our um, experience, we understand that the 150, that's supposed to be 150 per day, is actually a little bit uh, more almost as equal to 450, and that's what we do with our poor responders. I wouldn't dare to give it to a young uh, woman, so I don't want her to hyperstimulate because I can't draw it back. But for the poor responder that I'm sure that she will not hyperstimulate, this steady stimulation is pretty nice and, and goes well with what we want to achieve. And the stimulation protocol, look at that. So instead of, I don't know, 26 or 28 uh, injections in the long protocol or 16 in the short one, we actually get a um, better result uh, or the same result with 10, 10 injections. And the proof for that, these were three studies that were shown, but I will show you one of the studies that uh, was done by Kolibiansik. And he showed uh, in his work that the metaphase uh, eggs were the same with the Elonva and um, um, with the regular FSH, uh, as with the embryo transferred, uh, that was the same. And I wanted to show you that we don't uh, really 
see them because they don't come back to us, but people who drop out of the program mainly will do that because of psychological burden. Let's talk a little bit about natural IVF. We discussed that uh, previously, so we know that mild stimulation, lower aneuploidy, and sometimes we get the same um, success. I came uh, to this uh, interesting article about birth weight and natural cycles, so sometimes there is uh, uh, more to it than uh, what we see. Um, this study looked at live birth rate uh, in modified natural comparing to uh, high dose FSH stimulation. I showed that in the previous uh, lecture too. Um, so they retrospectively looked according to the Bologna criteria in their um, low responders and found uh, that the pregnancy rate was four times higher using the minimal stimulation, so that's something interesting to keep in mind. Let's talk a little bit about adjuvant therapy. So adjuvant is addition, like the spices that you use here in the Indian food, which make it very tasty. We know that we have to try to manipulate the egg, if I can say so, in a certain time in the egg's life. So we can do that very early, the primordial site time, because it's too early, but we can't do that once there are already antral follicles. So we have like three months before to try to kick in with our adjuvant therapy. Androgen supplementation, so um, we know that uh, the supplementation may increase the number of antral follicle and is upregulating the FSH receptors. Um, this study was a randomized study that looked at the transdermal testosterone, um, showing that there was no difference in the live birth rate. Um, so the number of RCTs that were showing benefit is one, and the number of RCTs that showed no benefit were three. Again. If there will be another RCT, the meta-analysis will change again. So we actually am not sure where things are um, standing. Uh, reports about DHEA, which is another androgen, was starting from the year 2000. So it's quite a while ago. Uh, and they showed that with their DHEA cycles, they had uh, more follicles uh, and more eggs uh, with the other one. But of course, the famous uh, report was by Glacier and uh, and associate when he, sh he showed 43-year-old women that started the cycles at their clinic, and all of a sudden she got way more eggs. And they asked her, did you do anything else? She said, oh, I started to take something that the uh, uh, doctor prescribed me, and they didn't know that. And from there, the DHEA star has started to rise. Uh, so we know that the addition of DHEA for poor responders uh, is something uh, that many people looked at. Another randomized uh, trial that came from Israel found that the, the mean E2 was significantly different, but at the end, the clinical pregnancy rate and the live birth rate didn't change. And again, I will say that with these poor responders, it's very difficult to get a pregnancy, so it's very difficult to compare pregnancies because we have so many cycles that will go on without a pregnancy. That's why it is so important when we do our trial to go by strict criteria and then we can collect trials that were done in different places and maybe get really answers for what we do. So that's another RCT about DHEA and uh, they showed a significant difference and many more pregnancies with the DHEA than um, with, without the DHEA. So again, two RCTs were in favor Four RCTs showed no benefit. Need to be decided what's going on with that. Um, is that a miracle drug or a treatment of poor responder, hyperhope? That was another letter in uh, human reproduction. So let's go to talk a little bit about growth hormone. Additional growth hormone enhances the response to, of the gonadotropin cells to the gonadotropins and acts by increasing the local production of IGF-1, which plays a critical role in the ovarian steroidogenesis. Is that so? So again, looking at some data that was published years ago from my unit in Israel, I wasn't there at that time, but uh, they didn't find any difference between the study control uh, and um, the, the study group and the control in terms of a number of oocytes and the embryo transferred. Another study that was done uh, elsewhere, um, patient treated with uh, growth hormones suffered fewer pregnancy losses resulting in higher delivery uh, and that was actually significant, showing that there was uh, the addition of uh, growth hormone uh, did good to this patient. So that's the addition of growth hormone um, uh, to IVF uh, ICSI it will make it better. Another RCT. So the result uh, showed that the duration. Um, I know that I have to have three or four more minutes. We started a little bit early. Okay. 
Um, so we saw that the, the addition of uh, growth hormone significantly lowered the duration of the treatment, the duration of GnRH antagonist treatment, and the loss of gonadotropin, increased the E2 uh, and the metaphase 2 oocytes and the fertilized oocyte, all that, but there was no difference again in clinical pregnancy rate and, and live birth rate. So the efficacy of growth hormone, that was uh, the most recent meta-analysis that I found uh, that was published last year. They reviewed 11 uh, studies, significantly increased E2, improved the number of 2PN and obtained embryos. However, again, no significant difference was found for overall implantation rate and clinical pregnancy rate. So growth hormone, if you look at that met last meta-analysis, it, it's not sure that it helps. First uh, reports about CoQ10 came from Toronto, from Bob Casper. Um, he looked at mice and said that he thinks that the aging of the ovary is because of aging of mitochondria that uses a lot of energy. And if I help them by increasing their CoQ10 amount, which is very uh, important to the energy cycle of the mitochondria, I will rejuvenate these eggs. He has actually... Um, thought that aneuploidy was a consequence of the deficient mitochondria energy production and supplementation will help to change that. So they started presenting at the SRM 2009, showing the work with mice that was extraordinary and things looked very nice with the CoQ10 uh, supplementation to old mice that improved their ovine response and delayed ovine follicle loss, loss due to aging. But when they wanted to go on doing that uh, research on uh, women, they didn't get the same fascinating results, so you can look at the, at the results here, and we can see that no significant difference in the outcome was actually detected. Again, many more uh, studies were there. I will just go fast through that. Oh, I'm sorry. But again, it cannot be concluded that the treatment will improve oocyte quality. We still do give those things, I think, the DHEA and the CoQ10, because we don't think that it harms anything. But if you ask me, what are the evidence there? I'm not sure I can answer that. Um, PGS, I will go that very quickly because I don't have time, but we think that poor pregnancy rate and high miscarriage rate is because of high rate, uh, is because of we are dumping the, the trash embryo, we are just putting them in and hope for the best. So again, if I could only take one good embryo inside, I would get better results, and we showed that uh, yesterday on, on our talk. Is that really indication for PGS? Is poor response indication for PGS? Mainly, that woman will get cycle after cycle, the answer, there are no embryos, there are no embryos. But if we get good embryo, that might help. And that uh, paper was published from the group uh, in Spain, uh, the Ivy group, uh, which really believe in that. And I think that uh, the main thing, I will just jump to the conclusions. They are collecting eggs, and at the end, they will do a transfer with a collected egg. So if a patient of mine that was poor response and I got egg every month, so I got, let's say, four or five eggs after four or five months, and of course I offered her donor eggs and she declined that. If I have those eggs, I may get pregnancy. And that's something that, to bear in mind that we can see actually nice pregnancy rate with embryos that were tested and uh, got from a poor responder uh, patient. So let me go quickly to the end. So again, um, their success uh, but more than twofold uh, for patients that were over 40 with gamete uh, um, accumulation. Futile treatment, so less than 1% of success rate will be futile. What do we do with these patients? So again, if they are very poor prognosis patient, um, we can still achieve pregnancies and by collecting the eggs and maybe doing some of the things, we can do that. So look at that study that was published just last year. I'm almost done. So if you have three or more embryos, you get 7.4% of pregnancy rate. That's not zero. So for a patient that says, I will not do donor egg, let's just keep on going, sometimes we tell her, no, let's stop that. But sometimes if we still get embryos and they're not empty, we can still get some pregnancies as long as we believe in that. So um, what did we take home? Many definitions, mainly for research. If we stick to the Bologna criteria, which are now the guidelines, we may be able to collect data enough to have some answers that will be sitting on evidence. Higher dose, not always better. Modify natural cycle may work. DHA works, CoQ10 perhaps, and growth hormone still in research. And if I can get three nice embryos, pregnancy could be achieved.
Thank you.